So good morning and welcome to the security sector professionals, key stakeholders and observers who have joined us from many countries to be part of this webinar organized by the Africa Center for Strategic Studies and the Ichikowitz Family Foundation. My name is Dr. Daisy Mwibu. I am an assistant professor of security studies here at the Africa Center. I co-lead the portfolios on counterterrorism and countering violent extremism, as well as a portfolio on countering transnational organized crime. This webinar will examine strategic approaches to engage effectively with youth in preventing and countering violent extremism in Africa. Moreover, as will be discussed by our panelists, we will also examine youth attitudes on political stability and instability on the continent, as well as political violence more broadly. Now, before we kick off our discussions with our panelists, I would like to invite our acting director, Colonel Retired Dan Hampton, to deliver a few introductory remarks about the Africa Center. The floor is yours, acting director. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mwibu. <clears throat> good afternoon and good morning, and thank you so much for taking time to be with us today and for your interest in this uh, important program. As Dr. Mwibu mentioned, my name is Daniel Hampton, and I'm the acting director for the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Many of you may know the Africa Center, uh, but for those who are new to us, just a quick refresher. Uh, this year, we're marking our 25th anniversary, and the Africa Center was established by our Congress in 1999 for the study of security issues relating to Africa and serving as a forum for research, communication, and exchange of ideas. And to achieve this mandate from our Congress, we had the following mission statement, to advance African security, by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. Within the Africa Center, we're organized around three pillars to execute our mission. First is our academic affairs section, and they organize seminars, workshops, webinars, events like the one you are all participating in today. Second, we have our research and strategic communications division. If you're not familiar with our website, africacenter.org, I would strongly encourage you to check it out and use it as a resource. We have a number of publications on our website, all in PDF, in English, French, Portuguese, and some other languages as well. And we routinely publish blog posts, spotlights, information graphics. And so please use our website. It's there as a resource for you. The third section of our organization is our community and alumni affairs and they work on building and sustaining those enduring partnerships I spoke about in our mission statement. I'm pleased that we have so many alumni joining us today for this webinar. I frequently say, and I truly believe that our alumni network is the true strength of the Africa Center. And our relationship with you, it keeps us relevant and keeps us focused on the security issues that are most important to Africans. And that's where our value lies in meeting the demand signals and addressing the issues that are important to our African partners. I'm very pleased that we're able to offer this webinar today. Uh, the 12th of August is International Youth Day. Uh, every year in August, close to International Youth Day, we try to do a webinar focused on uh, youth issues in Africa. There's much discussion and recognition of a youth bulge in Africa and the opportunities and challenges that this demographic trend portends. We are very pleased to partner with our colleagues at the Ichikovitz Family Foundation to explore this important topic. Uh, Ivor, it's very good to see you again. I think it was a couple of years ago in Zambia the last time we met, so good to see you, albeit virtually. Uh, Dr. Amegbo and Dr. Mwibu, thank you very much for organizing this event today. And now Daisy, back over to you to kick us off. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Acting Director Hampton. Now, as we begin our discussion, I want to first briefly go over some ground rules for this seminar. As I mentioned, the overall purpose of the webinar is to examine how to engage effectively with youth in preventing and countering violent extremism in Africa, and also examine youth attitudes on political stability and instability on the continent and discuss political violence more broadly. We will begin the session with a presentation from Mr. Ivor Ichikowitz, the founder of the Ichikowitz Family Foundation, 
who will go over the results of the 2024 Africa Youth Survey that captures the aspirations, motivations, and viewpoints of Africa's youth. Following his presentation, I will lead our three panelists, Ms. Phyllis Mwema, Mr. Mutaru Mukhtar, and Mr. Christian Leke, in a discussion on the strategies to engage effectively with youth in preventing and countering violent extremism and other forms of political violence and instability in Africa. For now, I want to turn over the floor to Mr. Ivor Ichikowitz. He is the founder of the Ichikowitz Family Foundation, a South African-based organization dedicated to advancing the principles of active citizenship through the preservation of African heritage, environmental conservation, and youth empowerment. In 2020, the Chikoas Family Foundation commissioned the most comprehensive survey on Africa's youth, the African Youth Survey of 2020. It covered 14 African countries, interviewing over 4,000 youth. And for publication this September, Today, he's going to be talking about, in the next 15 minutes, uh, discussing the Foundation's 2024 Youth Survey results. And these will be made publicly available and published uh, in September. And I believe there's going to be a video that's going to play prior to his remarks. By 2030, in just eight years' time, Africans will make up 42% of the world's young people. So their young people need to be listened to. The Africa Youth Survey has questioned thousands of young people across the continent. The survey showed that a growing number of young people are planning to emigrate in the next three years with South Africa seen as the most appealing destination within Africa. More than half had to pause their education or lost their job as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. Young people in Africa are more determined than ever to make the continent a better place. That's the finding of the 2022 African Youth Survey conducted by the Ichikowitz Foundation. The African Youth Survey is the most comprehensive survey of Africa's youth to date. It is designed to provide a better understanding of the hopes, challenges and aspirations of Africa's youth. Policy makers, not just in Africa, but all over the world, need to listen to their voices. They need to understand how to invest in the continent, how to engage with the continent, in order to harness the power that this generation represents. The results that we found in this survey will help in terms of having that open and honest view and reflection in terms of you know, the issues that young people are faced with. Young people know what they want. If the state cannot help them, they will do it alone. They are self-confident, driven and crafters of their own destiny. We're giving the youth of Africa an opportunity to use their voice. We're seeing a population that understand that they can make their own reality. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's, uh, I know it's, it's very early in a lot of places in the world. It's a beautiful, um, sunny, winter's afternoon here in Johannesburg in South Africa. And uh, it's uh, really a great pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to all of you um, about this, uh, the 2024 edition of the African uh, Youth Survey. The survey um, itself is only going to be published in September. So we're sharing with you um, information that um, that is embargoed and, until then. And anybody who wants to um, to, 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 to publish it or refer to it is more than welcome to do so, but please only after the 2nd of September. Um, the, the part of this that we're talking about today specifically relates to um, security and, and terrorism and um, very importantly relates to one of the most important factors in my mind that affects the African continent. Um, before we get on to that, let me tell you a bit about the survey. So we started the survey um, four years ago. I started the survey, frankly, for very selfish reasons. Um, I spent my life traveling the world, being told about what a basket case Africa really is. Um, I, I, I spent time in the boardrooms of the world, um, being told about an Africa that I didn't know. I've spent my whole life, my whole career, 35 years of it, traveling and working on this incredible continent. 
and my perception and understanding of what Africa was about and the perception and understanding of the people that make policy decisions about Africa, that make investments in Africa, was co were completely at odds. And at a point, I thought to myself, I better go and find out if I'm right or they're right. Because I saw an Africa of opportunity, an Africa that had a, a, a positive attitude, an Africa with a youth that was looking into the future, and they were seeing an Africa that was frankly uninvestable. Um, it was a big risk because there was a point where I wondered whether I'd been, I was being delusional. And when we did the first edition of the survey, there was a lot of skepticism around this because we had a lot to, to, to find out. And one of the key issues was, was there really such a thing as a pan-African youth consciousness? You know, North Africa, East Africa, West Africa, South Africa, Southern Africa are so diverse and so different in so many ways. Um, that it wasn't immediately obvious that there was such a thing as an African, an African youth. Well, the good news is I was right. Everybody else was wrong. There is an African youth consciousness and we live on the most exciting continent in the world. This is a continent that is absolutely brimming with opportunity and it is a continent that is brimming with positiveness and a continent that's brimming with hope. Um, and unfortunately, you know, because a lot of you are on this webinar, it means that I'm preaching to the choir. I think a lot of you probably know and understand that. But our job and responsibility is to take this data, which is now scientific data, and share it with the rest of the world that really think our continent um, is, 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 is in, a, in a different place and a, a, a different, has a different set of circumstances. So... What we do in the survey is every, every four years, we, we survey the entire continent. We survey 10 countries, 10 of the same countries every single year. We, we add additional countries um, to, to get to 16. We do between five and 6,000 face-to-face interviews with, uh, um, with individuals. These interviews are all one-hour interviews, so this is not a kind of a snap poll on Twitter or on Facebook. This is a real, real survey that covers many, many aspects um, of, of, of we, we, we cover economics, we cover security issues, we cover political issues, we cover social issues, we cover issues about the consumption of media, we cover um, issues about foreign intervention in countries. We, we deal both with, with fact as well as perception. Um, and what we found is that perception in Africa often becomes reality. So we have to know and understand what that perception is, is all about. Um, the demographics, we, 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 we split 50-50 male and female, and we cover um, educated, uneducated, rural, um, urban areas very, very carefully. And the science has now proven itself. Over four um, editions, we've managed to, 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 to prove that the science works. So you're going to need to take... Uh, with, with, with a great deal of confidence, the fact that what I'm sharing with you is, is backed by very solid science. So one of the key things that comes out of the survey is a matter that is very close to my, my own heart. Um, peace and stability on the continent is central to everything. If you have a peaceful, stable continent, then you the continent becomes a catalyst for investment, um, local um, in, in investors and local role players are prepared to keep their money and their property on the continent. Foreign investors are encouraged to bring um, investment onto the continent and prosperity and job creation and everything else that is, is obviously a, 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 um, part of the challenges that we have um, then, then follow. So peace and stability is something that we've covered extensively. First of all, in my day job or in one of my day jobs, I run a large aerospace and and defense concern that is very much focused on Africa. And that business has an interesting background. Um, South Africa, it is what I call an accident of, uh, of history. South Africa, as you may well know, was very actively involved in a, um, a, an extreme um, struggle for a long time. It developed a extensive defense and aerospace industrial complex, uh, complex mainly focused on acting as a proxy for the United States and Europe in a proxy war against Russia, um, the Cubans as proxy for the Russians, and South Africa, bizarrely enough, the apartheid government in South Africa as proxy for the United States. 
And the United States snookered themselves. They snookered themselves in that there were huge embargoes on South Africa. South Africa had to go and fight a war in Angola on behalf of, uh, of Western democracies. They didn't have the capability to do so, so they grew a large defense and aerospace industry. When Nelson Mandela came into power in 1994, he was confronted by this huge industry and uh, everybody said, shut this industry down. And he said, absolutely not. The defense and aerospace industry in South Africa is an asset of the African continent. It is an asset that is going to ensure that African governments are able to defend the democracies we fought so hard um, to protect. And everybody thought that he was completely nuts. But the reality is that he was not nuts at all. He was quite right. To, to go through revolutionary um, experiences, to go through struggles, to create democracies, and then not be able to defend those democracies is hugely problematic. I landed up in the defense and aerospace industry completely by mistake. It was as a result of, uh, of the fact that uh, Nelson Mandela found it, uh, determined that the industry was of paramount importance, and that's how paramount um, became a reality. So here we are today, 2024, we're still in a, in, in, on a continent that has huge um, conflicts and, 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 and security challenges. Um, but we now have a, a um, number of governments that are actually starting to pay some serious attention to those. Now, the back end of this is the extent to which the population of Africa themselves starting to understand that security on the continent is of fundamental importance uh, to future growth and, and stability. And up until recently, it really wasn't a major factor because each country was so isolated that very few people were had, had the level of consciousness about what was going on in the whole continent to be able to see and understand that uh, defense, security, and stability was a real issue that was affecting everybody. Despite the fact that you may um, have lived in a country that was completely stable, instability elsewhere was a matter of, of, of huge concern. What the survey has shown is that political instability is identified by the bulk of the, the, the respondents as the second most important issue facing growth and development on the continent. Now, um, death and infectious and 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 and, and uh, um, death from infectious disease and and uh, pandemics is obviously high in everybody's mind coming out of COVID. But political instability still remains one of the absolute key concerns um, to, 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 to the population. In 2022, 15% responded 20, um, positively, 14% in 2024, not much of a change. Um, but the fact is that it comes, it, 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 it is identified um, not, not just as a, an outcome of um, the, the it's, it's, it's got to be identified in the context of all of the rest of the issues that have been identified by the people surveyed. Sorry, I seem to have lost control of my presentation. Just give me 30 seconds. Hopefully I now have control of my presentation back. There we go. Um, so a large percentage of the youth surveyed understand that political instability is a massive concern. Now, it's very interesting to see the mix. Um, so Ethiopia, Cameroon, 35%, 31%. Cote d'Ivoire keeps coming up as, a, as a, a, a big number, and it's very interesting because what the survey has done for us in the past is it's given us a look into what's likely to happen into the future. So... In the last survey, Gabon had a very, very high level of, uh, of, of concern, and you know what has happened in Gabon. Same, same situation um, in, in, in places like Kenya. Um, and, and interestingly enough, places like Namibia, which we perceive to be completely stable, um, keep recurring as a, as, a, as a very high number. So what we're finding is that these numbers are starting to tell us about what's happening on the ground and starting to act as a crystal ball, if you like, into what could be happening on the continent into the future. Um, so when we talked to, um, to, to, to the respondents about 
what they saw as the single most important priorities for the focus uh, to, 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 for Africa to progress. Obviously, reduction in corruption comes up as, as number one, and it comes up as number one again and again and again. Job creation, huge issue, always. But in the top five, we are consistent in seeing the achievement of peace and stability throughout the continent um, as one of the, 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 the top five. Now, it's interesting, in 2020, 17% responded accordingly, and in 2022, 13% responded accordingly. And part of the reason that we believe that that's the case is that there appears to have been um, a very big focus by a number of African governments on regional peace and stability um, to an extent that didn't exist publicly in 2020. And there's, there's this quite a big debate about why the number has come down despite the fact that the number of conflicts has actually increased. So here again, looking country by country, um, we, 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 we see countries like Cote d'Ivoire um, with huge numbers that don't automatically relate to exactly what's going on on, on the ground right now. Um, it is interesting to note that in South Africa, um, these, these, this polling was done in March, just before the elections in South Africa. And I personally expected to see the South African numbers much, much higher. But if you look at the, the South African numbers, they still are high, 10%, but they are nowhere near what I had expected um, them to be. Kenya, absolutely polled where we expected it to be, and you know what's, what's happened in, in Kenya. Rwanda, really interesting. You'll see later in the numbers that Rwandese are generally very happy with the way their government deals with regional peace and stability, but the Rwanda-Congo um, conflict is something that is very, very high um, on the agenda of the youth in, in, in Rwanda, despite the fact that they think their government is dealing with it very well. So this, for me, is one of the most central and important issues, because the African youth that we are talking to are the next generation of leaders. The fact that they see peace and stability as a priority is a huge positive. But also the way they see the, the, their governments dealing with it is very, very important because it's a litmus test of the perception of whether governments are taking this issue seriously enough or not. Now, in 2022, 57% of the people polled were completely dissatisfied with the way their governments were dealing with it. Um, in 2024, 52% are dissatisfied. Now, that goes to show that there has been an improvement, if not in the actual reaction of governments to, to, to insurgencies and instabilities, there's certainly a perception that that, that that is the case. Now, very key to this is the whole discussion around democracy and the future of democracy in Africa and how it relates um, to political stability. Now, I've always been very interested to understand what the appetite for democracy is on the African continent. Now, you might say, well, that's ridiculous. How, how can you even be discussing the appetite for democracy when the whole continent has been fighting for um, a, a democratic system? Now, there's been this huge debate as to whether Western-style democracy is, in fact, the right form of government for, for Africa. And the place you have to start is by questioning whether there is an appetite for democracy amongst the African youth, whether the African youth see democracy as a system as being the right system for the future. And very encouragingly, in 2022, 76% of the people polled absolutely believe that. And very interestingly, in 2024, that number had reduced quite dramatically to 69%. Now, what is even more interesting is when we ask whether a Western-style democracy was a suitable style of democracy or whether an African new style of democracy needed to be put into the mix, you'll see what the numbers said. 2022, 54% believed, or, or, or the larger percentage believed that a Western-style democracy was the way to go. 2024, everybody is starting to say, hey, maybe we need to think this democracy thing through again. 
We need to think about what is the right form of democracy for, for Africa. We need to think about whether we, 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 we shouldn't be incorporating an African style of, of, of leadership with a Western style of leadership, and whether we shouldn't be coming up with a new style of democracy. Now, this talks to a whole other debate we have in the, in the survey around the concept of autocratic leadership. And a really a disproportionate number of African youth do believe that if a democratic system can't solve the, the challenges that the continent faces, that we should be looking at a far more autocratic form of leadership. And that's very concerning because to me, that undoes a lot of the good work that we've done over the years on, on, on the continent. Now, one of the key issues is, is this a demographic that supports peaceful protest? Or is this a demographic that is actually prepared to use their voice and support the concept of non-peaceful protest? to enact political change. Now, we mentioned in the video earlier, and I talk a lot about the fact that this is a demographic, this is a group of young Africans who, first of all, have never had the yoke of colonialism and have never lived under apartheid. This is a group of young Africans who see their Africanness as a superpower. They don't see their Africanness as a handicap. This is a group of Africans who are telling us that they are prepared to get out there and vote with their feet by protesting if necessary. And what I find most concerning is a very high percentage of the people that we poll are prepared to support non-peaceful protest to enact political change. And this is very, this, this for me is extremely alarming. It's alarming on the one hand and also very encouraging on the other hand. It's encouraging because people are prepared to get out there and make their voices heard. It's alarming on the other hand because the whole concept of non-peaceful protest is absolutely in the mix. And you'll see that these numbers are not insignificant. Now, the smallest percentage is in Rwanda because uh, um, we all... We, we, we all know about the, the, the reality of, 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 of Rwanda, and we all understand that it's very much an autocratic um, system. And there's no question that the numbers that we get out of Rwanda always need to be tested, retested, and double retested. But it's interesting to note that the Rwandese population don't think that uh, um, non-peaceful protest is a good idea at all. It's also very interesting to note that 70% of respondents in South Africa are prepared to go out there and burn things if their government doesn't get stuff right. It's even more concerning to me that 76% uh, of the people of Kenya believe that, and you know what's going on in Kenya. Um, and then again, Cote d'Ivoire with a particularly high number, and I think that's telling us about uh, what's going on there and what might go on there into the future. So. Here again, this number for me is extremely alarming. In 2020, 16% of the people polled admitted to participating in political demonstrations in the last year. Now, look, this slide comes with a health of it because I, I believe that a lot of people who do protest, participate in political protests uh, don't want that to be too public. And because of the nature of the survey, there, there, there is certain information that does have to be moderated. And I think that this one, you'll probably find the numbers are on the low side. I think the actual numbers are quite a lot higher than what we, the, the, what we eventually get. But what is alarming to me and what is very interesting is that from 16% in 2020 to 21% in 2024. So this is demonstrating, it's absolutely proving that these are not just people who are, who are saying that they're going to um, vote with their feet. These are people who are actually doing it and they're doing it right now. Now this slide to me is, is very terrible. In 2022, 61% of the respondents specifically disapproved of the concept of military rule. In 2024, 
41% approved. That number has doubled. That number has doubled. So from 22% who saw military rule as an alternative to democratic rule, in 2024, 41% feel the same way. Now, this is, again, it's, it's, it's very, very telling. Where democracies have failed, the youth of Africa today are saying, we are prepared to give up democracy in favor of military rule if that's going to get us the quality of life that we believe that we deserve. Now, it's going to be very interesting to track this into the future. Because obviously, from a Western perspective, the worst thing that can possibly happen in Africa is for there to be a, um, a, 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 a spate of additional coups and a spate of additional military governments. And I would imagine that every Western government right now's primary concern is to avoid that from happening. But relate that to what African, the African youth are saying. They're saying that we want prosperity, we want to be given opportunities, we want an end to corruption, we want to see job creation, we want to see investment on the continent, and if our dem democratically elected governments are not able to do that, we are going to do something about it, and if it means that we have to live under a military government, we're happy to do so too. And I think that this is a very, very serious wake-up call to every single political leader on the continent. Because if you don't listen to, 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 to what these people are saying, well, the consequence is, is, is absolutely clear. So political stability is, uh, is today a reality that touches many, many people's lives because of the insurgencies that are taking place on the continent. And terrorism is becoming a very real factor in the lives of almost every one of the people that we're talking to. So if you look at these numbers, in 2020, 3% of the people we spoke to knew somebody who had been approached by a terror group, a recruiter, or some form of radical insurgent. It was almost irrelevant. Nobody, nobody in any way kind of considered it to be that important. In 2024, 13% of the people we spoke to had had some direct interaction with a recruiter or a terror organization. Now, that is properly, properly alarming. When we asked if how many people knew somebody who supported a terror group or who was involved in some form of radical insurgency, again, we go from 3% to 10%, very alarming. Then, even more alarming, direct recruitment attempts from 3% in 2020 to 9% of the people we speak, we speak to. Now, if you take that in the context of what's going on on the continent today, this is, again, something that needs to be paid attention to by the whole world. Because these terror organizations are not just recruiting to perpetrate terror in Africa. These terror organizations are, are recruiting to perpetrate terror worldwide. And African governments need to pay attention to this, but more importantly, Western governments need to be supporting African governments to get to the root cause of this and to be dealing with these issues where they arise. So again, interesting. 51%, 53%, relatively high number of people are saying that terrorism, insurgency, armed conflict are affecting their everyday lives by restricting freedom of movement. Now, in 2024, in modern Africa, this, this should be at 1% or 2%, not at 51%. So one of the other things we pay a lot of attention to is how we communicate with this demographic. Um, and... Every, anybody who, who is in the security environment knows that wars, insurgencies, conflict um, is not just about guns and bombs. It's also about information. 
And the use of information in Africa in the um, in, in, in winning the hearts and minds of people for radical um, ideologies is very much a, a huge priority and needs to be counted. And what is very interesting to us is that the African youth know and understand the issues of fake news. They are much more alert and alive to the risk of being manipulated than you might think. So 78%, between 75 and 78% understand that fake news is a problem. They also understand that terrorist organizations and criminal organizations use fake news as a mechanism to recruit and to manipulate. And this for me is, is, is a very positive um, statistic, but we need to get from 72 to 73% to 100% of the African youth who understand the danger of fake news. And the call to action here is to support education campaigns throughout the continent to make sure that this is a tool and a weapon that is completely disabled into the future. So we put this, 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 this slide in just to demonstrate a, a, a look that we take country by country. We literally go um, look at these issues that affect specific countries um, and, 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 and talk to the youth about the impact that their specific conflicts are having country by country. And there's just too much of this to go into now. But it just goes to show how the youth who really should not be engaging with these issues are extremely concerned about what's going on on their borders and what's going on around them, even if it doesn't impact them every single day. And this is making, helping them to, or, or, or inhibiting them from making decisions around Im immigration. It's inhibiting them uh, from making decisions around um, investment. It's inhibiting them from all kinds of things. Mr. Echikowicz, uh, we have about two more minutes. So. Domestic safety and security is as important as, as, as uh, um, continent-wide continent safety and security. And these are some interesting numbers. There, there is a relatively high percentage of people that are satisfied with the way their governments are reacting. But you'll see that these numbers have gone from 21% in 2020 down to, I'm um, sorry, from 46% in 2020 down to 42%. And again, governments need to pay attention to this because if there is a perception that governments are not reacting or dealing with domestic stability issues correctly, then, then that clearly indicates that we're doing something wrong. Now, this slide to me represents one of the biggest concerns um, that the survey in 2024 has demonstrated. 25% of the people polled have indicated that they have been in some way victims of crime in the past five years. Now, again, Rwanda always comes out at the very bottom. So here you have an autocratic government that seems to be dealing with crime effectively. 26% of people in South Africa and 45% of people in Tanzania. And what's the scariest one for me? 39% of people in Botswana, a country that's considered to be one of the safest countries on the continent. There's a whole discussion to be had around this, but it's a very, very important issue to keep in mind. So in order to, 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 to deal with the elimination of, of crime in a country, um, penalties and punishment need to be appropriate. Now, it's really interesting to, to note that a big percentage of the people polled don't believe that penalties are harsh enough. A meaningful percentage believe they're about right, but a very big percentage don't believe that they're harsh, harsh enough. And this tells you something because it makes crime an acceptable part of society because the consequences are not as serious as they could or should be. So what are the key takeaways from, from all of this? First of all, Peace and security remain a very, very serious concern to the youth of Africa, and obviously, as we all know, a very serious concern to the future of the continent. Democracy and political stability is, to a large extent, in question here. 
Even though democracy is seen and identified as a preferable form of government, there is a big percentage of the African youth who are starting to question Western-style democracy as a real solution to Africa long term. And my takeaway here is we need to start that dialogue. If Western forms of democracy are not right, what is the right form of democracy? And how do we start engaging to determine what that is? Then, of course, terrorism is a major, major concern. Um, Western governments have got to start accepting that Africa is a hotbed for terrorism. It is a recruitment center for terrorist activity around the world. African, the African youth are starting to see terrorism as a massive inhibitor to growth and development. Um, and this needs very serious attention and to be brought to the attention of, of the world. And then, of course, domestic safety and security. If we do not convince the youth of Africa that they are safe in their countries, that they have, that their assets are safe, that investing in their countries, both in time and in resource, is, is, is safe, then we are going to see the huge levels of migration that are of concern to the world. So despite the fact that I am hugely optimistic about the future of the continent, despite the fact that I am coming out of the 2024 um, edition of the, the survey, we see huge reason to be optimistic about the future of the continent. Peace, security, terrorism, internal stability still remain one of the key issues and need to be on the global agenda, not just on the African agenda. I thank you. There's a lot of information to get through. I've probably terribly run over my time, but very much looking forward to discussing, um, discussing this in the time we have left. Thank you so much, Ms. Echekowitz. That was a very informative overview. There's certainly so much that we can glean from these survey results. For now, I'd like to turn the microphone over to the three panelists for a broader discussion and conversation. We have the good fortune to have with us today, Ms. Phyllis Mwema, who is currently the Executive Director of Kenya Community Support Center, a non-governmental organization in Kenya that works on countering violent extremism in close partnership with the security sector. Ms. Mwema is a local practitioner in CVE, or Countering Violent Extremism, with nine years of experience designing projects that respond to violent extremist drivers, and building local capacity for community groups and civil society. Next, we have Mr. Mutaru Mumuktar, who is a practitioner of preventing and countering violent extremism and is also executive director for the West Africa Center for Counter Extremism. His work focuses on the underpinnings of radicalization and violent extremism to implement effective national and regional counterterrorism strategies and policies. Lastly, but not at all in the least, we have Mr. Acheleke Christian Leke, who is a youth peace building and violent extremism expert from Cameroon with 16 years of experience. Mr. Leke was appointed to serve as African Union Youth Ambassador for Peace, representing the Central African region from 2022 to 2024, and he currently serves as the executive director of the local youth corner in Cameroon. I strongly encourage you all to review the extraordinary bios of these experts for more details on their important experiences and accomplishments. In the interest of in time, I will not go into those details so as to make space to hear from them and have them answer your questions. So to our three panelists, I would like to first gauge your general reactions and thoughts on the 2024 youth survey results that have just been published. Do any of these insights on how the youth view the challenges facing the continent and priorities for future progress, their views on democracy and political instability or stability, their views on terrorism, or even their attitudes and experiences with domestic safety and security reflect in some of the work you're currently involved with as part of your institution? And in what ways do you see these views and youth experiences play out? So very briefly, let's start with Ms. Phyllis Mwema. What are your thoughts? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, it's, it's good afternoon in Kenya. And uh, thank you so much, Africa Center, for organizing this uh, webinar. 
It's very timely, even as we are planning to commemorate the International Day of Youth, uh, that as practitioners, we begin to look at uh, the role of youth in preventing violent extremism. 100%, uh, I agree with the findings of this study. Uh, as, 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 as the results were being presented, I thought this is clearly the, the picture for what's going on in Kenya. I am sure most of you have followed uh, the last one month activities in Kenya and, and, and the fact that youth have definitely done what the survey has, has, has decided to come out and uh, raise their voice uh, to the political class who have been looking at the, the, the youth badge uh, as a threat instead of an opportunity. Uh, if you look at the Kenyan population, you realize that uh, out of the 52 million uh, Kenyans, 60% are youth. And uh, out of that 60%, 70% are unemployed. They are underemployed and they even lack political spaces uh, to participate in governance. Uh, the political class in Kenya looks at that as a threat and very busy planning how to crush, you know, this, this growing number of youth instead of utilizing that opportunity. Uh, so the, the, that demography for Kenya is a threat, and I agree that uh, you would rather find uh, non-peaceful -peace, approaches, you know, to demonstrate uh, when they are seeking for, 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 for democracy. Uh, the question of institutional factors, I am very much in line, aligned to the domestic safety and security. Uh, the reality in Kenya is that the police are, have actually been rated as the poorest security agency among the security sector agencies in the country. Not just because of corruption, but because of the high record of the, the, the human rights violations and the way the police perceive, uh, you know, the young people and the number of young people who are actually facing uh, police brutality on an everyday uh, basis. So I totally agree with that. Uh, and I know we have already have some programs that he has, he has recommended uh, in trying to build the trust deficit that is really high. And we need to have very high trust between law enforcement and citizens if political uh, violence is to be reduced. Uh, but if we are, we are othering each other, you know, the, the, the youth look at the state as the other, and the state looks at the, the youth as the other, that other in is actually our biggest uh, challenge in Kenya. So I totally agree. And I will allow my other panelists to speak to that, but then I hope I will have the opportunity to even uh, speak more about uh, the takeaways. Thank you so much. Absolutely, we'll come back to you. How about you, Mr. Muttaru uh, Mukhtar? What are your thoughts? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Muribu. Uh, and good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you to the Africa Center for organizing this uh, webinar. And I'm particularly very excited because this uh, relates directly to the area that I am engaging on a very regular basis. And the, um, uh, you know, forgive me, the pronunciation of uh, the name of uh, the organization, uh, Ikitowi. Uh, family Foundation. Uh, very, very thankful for the opportunity to be part of, of this. I think the uh, the study, the Africa Youth Survey, it's very, very comprehensive in terms of the scope, the areas that it covers relating to young people. And I'm very uh, excited about the revealing, I mean, how revealing the findings have been. Uh, and many of the findings uh, actually uh, resonate with you know the work we do on the ground in terms of young people's aspirations and motivations uh, as well as the their aspirations uh, within the space i'm particularly more focused on the you know the west african uh, sub region uh, looking at young people and their vulnerabilities uh, and you know i find that it appears that the vulnerabilities that young people uh, have around them are not adequately appreciated by the state. And it appears that extremist groups understand these vulnerabilities in terms of the issues of unemployment, the issues of dissatisfaction in state institutions, uh, the law enforcement agencies, and even the mode of governance. Like the, the, the survey has revealed 
We are talking about the forms of governance, democracy. The support for democracy has, has you know, dipped, has reduced. Uh, of course, not that significant, but there's a reduction in support for democracy. Uh, and whilst it's still uh, a positive thing in, in, in broader terms, there's a reduction for support for democracy. And this aligns directly with the recent finding by the Afrobarometer uh, survey that, I mean, uh, constantly, uh, you know, carry out in, in, in many parts of Africa. And, and that kind of situation should give states the, uh, the platform or the opportunity to respond to the grievances and vulnerabilities around young people. Unfortunately, we are not seeing that. Like uh, I had, you know, Madam Weber talk about the fact that the protests going on are an opportunity for the state uh, to address the grievances by the state. And yet the state is busy preparing to crush them. And this is a lost opportunity. And states must take advantage of the growing grievances by young people, uh, work with young people, and design approaches and I mean, uh, options that address their grievances. And uh, broadly, extremist groups seem to understand young people better than the state. They understand the vulnerabilities, the aspirations, the motivations uh, around young people, and they take advantage of this understanding of vulnerabilities around young people and uh, weaponize their grievances and engage in recruitment or attacks in many parts of the region. Uh, if you look at the current um, statistics, we still see the Sahel, especially the tri-border region uh, between Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso, still being the epicenter of violent extremism. Uh, huge numbers in terms of fatalities with the direct and significant involvement of young people, both as victims as well as perpetrators. It tells you that PVE or counterterrorism measures must significantly focus on young people in understanding their vulnerabilities, the drivers and the factors that make them vulnerable to recruitment or to joining uh, extremist groups willingly. And this has not been addressed uh, you know, significantly by state actors within the spaces. Uh, so I think that I will stop here and then uh, allow my colleagues to, to come in and then we can have uh, questions and answers to this. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mukhtar. Uh, let me turn over to Mr. Christian Leke. What are your thoughts uh, briefly? Thank you very, very much, uh, Daisy. And uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be here. And uh, the Africa Center and partners, um, it's an honor to uh, to join this this conversation. Interestingly, when when uh, Mr. Ijokowit was speaking, I hope I pronounced the name very well, um, he, he noted very key things in the report. As a young person who has also had the opportunity to work across uh, different cultures and backgrounds, sincerely, sometimes when I sit in the room and people are talking about African youth, I'm like, is it the same continent where I'm coming from, the same continent where I've grown and risk life without um, little or no support, but to bring change, you know? And like the report is stating, African youth are not longer waiting for government. They are creating their own tables, solving their problems and inviting government to come there if they want or not. It's a very interesting uh, reflection. We are at a time where there's a lot of investment and time only talking about why do young people join violent extremist groups? It sounds very nice in the ear, but we are not reflecting about the majority of young people who are peace loving, who are not troublesome, who sometimes we are wishing that our peers who pick up arms can learn why do we face the same problems like them, but do not carry arms? This is the question we should be asking because we continuously make young people to be seen as perpetrators or victims. It sounds very nice, I must say, but it is what is not ending the cycle of violence in our continent. We have a continent of young people who are responding to the drivers of peace, violent extremism, security terrorism, in innovative ways, which they have little support for it. Look at the entrepreneurship sector today. Young people are creating jobs, responding to issues of lack of employment and others. These are the perspectives. Today, we talk about our governments, you know, seeing young people as troublemakers or not valorizing young people. I think that's not the case. I think they are intentionally not looking at how they were before. Many of the leaders that we have today who are aging, they became presidents at their young age as young people. They know how important young people are. If not, why do they come to us to mobilize us to commit political violence? These are the issues. 
So I think the bigger challenge is not just young people. They are the governments themselves. We need to train them. We need to equip them on how to deal with young people and even in chaotic times. Look at the protests we've had across the continent recently. Who are those who started the violence? It, can, it came mostly from security sector actors. Some heads of state would take two weeks to respond to their people. I think that our leaders and governments need more capacity on how to be able to interact and work with young people in times like this. As an African youth growing in a country where we've lived violent extremism for a long time and working on the field and the Lake Chad Basin region, I can tell you we have a huge opportunity to leverage on intergenerational learning to ensure that we can be able to build safe, secure, and prosperous communities. Because sometimes we think it's about taking the old away. That's not the case. Or it's about taking the young people away. That's not the case. How do we work together to solve these challenges that we are seeing with young people as equal partners with the government? And this is a reflection. The second thing which I want to reflect on and to close is the whole conversation of the added value of investing in young people work for peace and to prevent violent extremism. So many businesses, I'm very honored to see that uh, the foundation, uh, who is the, the CEO or the chairman, is a famous entrepreneur. How do businesses, media, and other institutions see the added value of investing in young people? There's a new conversation looking at the return on investment. For every one dollar that you invest in a young people working to, on peace, there's a possibility of a return between one to five dollars. How do businesses, how do countries see that investing in young people is not putting money or their resources into waste, but putting these resources in a place where even those who do businesses can make profit. And at the same time, we are building a society where young people see themselves as valued, as responsible, as equal partners, and respecting their elders and adults to build a continent which will be collaborative. So, I mean, for, for my initial reflections, I was coming from this perspective to say a key reflection for the continent is, let's not forget our roots, but ensure that collaboratively, we can be able to respond uh, to violent extremism, security issues uh, facing our continent. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that excellent response. I uh, appreciate hearing from all of you. Um, now I'm gonna uh, switch around the ordering a little bit. I have a few more questions. So let's first start with Mr. Mukhtar. Um, we heard a lot from the presentation uh, about how uh, youth are responding about being contacted to be recruited uh, or being aware of folks who have been already recruited by violent extremist organizations. Now, given your experience and expertise, may you share your insights into how and why terrorist groups seek to recruit and mobilize young people? And as you do so, may you very briefly share with our audience the role that your organization is playing to either highlight the role of youth in violent extremist prevention or prevent young people from joining violent extremist organizations. Again, uh, we can keep our responses concise just so that we can get through to other people's uh, comments. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, yes, there are various, various ways in which uh, violence extremist groups recruit young people. Uh, and I want to begin by looking at the sources of recruitment. Uh, the cyberspace is a big and sustained space for the engagement of violent extremist groups. And, and we just saw in the report uh, that, you know, the role of uh, the media I mean, social media, as well as technology in general, in using propaganda or fake news to advance the cause of violent extremists. Uh, they, do they use that for propaganda purposes to embolden, you know, their presence, their image, and create relevance for themselves and create narratives that are attractive to young people, vulnerable young people in this space. Uh, since 2014, uh, when we started focusing on young people in terms of preventing violent extremism in this space, we found cyberspace as a sustained environment using different networks and platforms uh, to appeal to young people or to recruit, uh, de I mean, deliberately uh, recruit young people in different areas of, of the region. And so uh, we have 23 individuals that we have stopped from leaving Ghana to join, in particular Ghana, largely to join extremist groups. And these individuals, nearly every one of them 
had engagement through social media platforms in the process of recruitment and the process of radicalization. So online is a big environment through which radicalization and recruitment takes place. Uh, uh, we have other forms, other forms, including familial ties and friends, social networks that uh, you know are used to influence uh, young people who are vulnerable for recruitment. We have young people who join the course, not necessarily because it's a deliberate decision to join, but they are influenced by their networks because some family members have joined, some friends have joined, and that narrative appeals to them because they live it as, as everyday reality. There are some environments where uh, young people do not really have enough options, uh, but to join the course, they call it this is the same as a legitimate course to join the fight against you know the state and against the local environment, especially in environments where recruitment and radicalization is built along either religious or ethnic lines. Uh, as you would notice, uh, the 2014-2015 period where we had Boko Haram type religious, religiously driven ISIS, Al Qaeda type terrorism significantly changed in West Africa. And we saw a significant feature of radicalization happening along ethnic lines, driven by marginalization along ethnic lines and along other lines of resource-driven conflicts. And so we had some of these individuals joining extremism or joining the groups because they felt marginalized along ethnic lines, not necessarily because of some powerful religious ideology that motivated them. So this sort of uh, dynamic motivates individuals to join extremist groups. And we'll see other situations where individuals have been forced into the fold of extremist groups. Uh, example, we had the abduction of you know, either young girls or boys or groups of people who are, I mean, abducted by extremist groups. And by default, they are forced to, you know, uh, you know, to get radicalized or to join the groups without necessarily having any option. And so those situations happen in this space. So these multiple forms, I mean, these are the key ways through which uh, violent extremists recruit people within this space in West Africa. There are other dynamics that are rare uh, in terms of individuals who are looking to live out a heroic fantasy of their own, and they find uh, violent extremism attractive, and they join those courses on their own, uh, self-radicalized individuals, uh, and, and it does happen in this space. Uh, we've been in this space in the last nine years, and. Uh, in November this year will be 10 years. Uh, we've seen remarkable uh, things that have happened in this space. How we engage here in West Africa is through the local community. The biggest demography that we have in terms of programming purposes is, is the local community. Uh, and the large, the larger part, I mean, the demography is young people in the local space, uh, because we believe that fighting terrorism uh, cannot be won only on the battlefield. It will won in the local community in addressing the drivers or what we call the underpinnings of radicalization and violent extremism. Factors that lead individuals uh, to become radicalized to engage in extremism or terrorist attacks. And it's very context specific. Uh, even within the same country, the vulnerabilities are very different. And so the local re reality differs from context to context. And so we work within the local community, targeting young people and community representatives to understand the local reality and look at how we provide solutions or approaches to dealing with it. And this webinar talks about strategic approaches to dealing with this problem in West Africa, I mean, in Africa in general. And here at our center, we see security measures as a function of threat perception. Your perception of the threat will lead you to certain measures. And the perspectives are different depending on the local context. And that is the approach that guide the work we do in terms of designing PVE measures within the local space. Uh, I'm not sure how much time I have now. Otherwise, I would stop at this point. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Sarah. I appreciate it. Next, I want to turn to uh, Ms. Phyllis Morma. I think uh, Mr. Mukhtar has done a good job of giving us a bit more of the landscape that is uh, in West Africa. 
And I wanted to ask you from your perspective, could you discuss the drivers, actors, and structures that contribute to the growth of violent extremism in East Africa? And as you do so, may you also briefly share with our audience the role that your organization is playing to either highlight the role of youth in violent extremist prevention or prevent young people from joining violent extremism? So thank you very much. Uh, once again, I will uh, very quickly uh, summarize because most of the drivers have actually been described. I think they are almost common across the continent. I just to add to what my brother just talked about, I want to talk about the, 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 the unkept promises, uh, frustrations uh, that the youth have experienced over time because of the promises that have been meant to their communities, to their parents, to themselves, uh, by their political class and by the government. And that 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 that's, that leads to poor service delivery. Uh, that most places in Kenya, uh, you will find regions where service delivery is extremely poor. And uh, people have to walk all, all to get into public uh, transport for almost six hours to access basic services like getting an identification card, for example. Uh, and, and that really uh, makes uh, people feel politically marginalized, uh, socially marginalized. The other aspect is about religious education. Uh, most of our young people do not spend a lot of time uh, receiving religious education. And then they are left mostly to colleagues, to peers, uh, to other people to interpret religion for them. That we found is a major, major driver. Uh, and, and, and because a lot of our religious institutions have also not embraced uh, the role of young people in religious institutions, they have always looked at them as a problem, as recipients of, of, of religion and, and, and religious ideologies. Uh, left the young people more vulnerable. Uh, finally, I just want to talk about economic opportunities uh, that, that that in Kenya is, is basically almost classified in terms of ethnicity, in terms of your, your political class. And a lot of youth today who don't understand ethnicity, don't understand why they cannot access uh, employment even when they are highly educated. And the more educated people remain idle, uh, the more then they, they, they get attracted to, to violent extremist groups. Kenya has a very high internet penetration. We're talking of almost 98% of uh, internet penetration. And that means the online spaces have been utilized uh, to recruit youth. One of the interesting questions was whether uh, people knew a recruiter. In the region where I work, we, we, we know recruiters by name. People have experienced recruitment even at family and community level. Recruitment used to happen a few years ago in, in physical spaces. And, and, and therefore, there has been gradual uh, uh, attraction uh, by families, by communities to actually sympathize with the violent extremist groups. And, and, and that compounds the entire problem of corruption and, and, and poor governance. Uh, Young people do not get spaces in, uh, in, in political parties, for example. Uh, political parties in Kenya are actually owned by individuals, by tribes, and it's rare that you'll find a young person getting a chance, and when they are given, they're just treated as beneficiaries. Uh, so, so in a nutshell, my organization, the Kenya Community Support Center, uh, which, is a, which is a public benefit organization based in Kenya and more, most, mostly focusing on the coastal region of the country, which has for many years been affected by violent extremism and terrorism, has worked with young people for the last 15 years. Uh, my organization was one of the first organizations that actually came face to face with the radicalization, even before Kenya as a country formulated strategies uh, to address this challenge. And, and most of the, 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 the work we've been doing has actually been to provide safe spaces uh, to bring young young people together to be able to discuss uh, uh, and 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 share their lived experiences, uh, and and from there we've documented all that, and have formulated programs that rally around uh, strengthening community policing, uh, uh, working together with the police to try and uh, address the the, the the trust gap, 
uh, formulating uh, platforms for accountability where the communities can air their grievances uh, to state authorities and they can get feedback around that. Uh, we have been able to formulate a, a, a regional early warning and early response mechanism, which provides an opportunity for communities to even share information on, on suspicious uh, activities in their communities uh, through a system that the, the organization runs if they cannot trust the police. And that has become a very important uh, avenue for, for preventing uh, crime and, and terrorism. As an organization, we are working to train, we have actually trained the police uh, and linked them with the communities, especially in the police stations where the police serve populations that they don't seem to understand uh, these populations. Uh, we've trained the police, we've made them aware about cultural rights, cultural practices, religious practices that sometimes are misinterpreted uh, as, as adherence to, to criminal groups. And uh, we have also been part of uh, a big network of civil society that uh, influences policy. Uh, so our organization has been very central to the, to the development of the national strategy for preventing uh, violent extremism. And as you may be aware, Kenya is one of the leading countries in Africa that has actually devolved uh, uh, prevention action, the prevention of, of radicalization through formulation of action plans at the very local level where the, the government then allowed civil society to provide leadership in formulating context-specific solutions uh, to violent extremism. So Kekoske, our organization, has been providing leadership around that. And I'm happy to report that uh, some of the programs that we have actually uh, been part of have, have contributed to a huge reduction of, of the reported uh, reduction of terror-related uh, uh, threats in Kenya. You may have seen reports that are saying actually this year we are almost uh, 5.2 uh, percent lower in terms of risk. And this is because people have come together at the local level. The young people have been given the opportunity to provide leadership and using internet. Uh, today, young people are finding their own, you know, uh, wealth creation. Uh, we've supported them with small grants to initiate environmental programs, to in initiate economic uh, programs. And we can say almost 20,000 of the youth that we work with are uh, today depending on themselves without having to go and beg political leaders and, and governments to offer them uh, opportunities of employment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Mwema. Now that we've heard a little bit about uh, what are the drivers of violent extremism and how folks are being recruited uh, within both East and West Africa. I'm curious to hear from you, Ms. Aleke, from the empirical literature on what makes for a more effective countering violent extremist response. Could you kindly highlight some of the reasons why security actors and young people must collaborate to address violent extremism in communities across Cameroon? And for, as I the other two panelists did, could you also briefly share with our audience the role your organization is playing either to highlight the role of youth in violent extremist prevention or prevent young people from joining violent extremist groups. And I ask that you kindly keep uh, responses concise to make space for more questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Daisy, for, for this perspective. I, I was tempted to say, uh, permit me give a, a reflection on the, the, the previous question, uh, which is around recruitment. Um, there's a model I call the empowerment model. Um, that's what violent extremist groups use. It works like magic. Young people want to feel like heroes. Uh, institutions and governments are failing to valorize the little uh, that young people do. Put yourself a parent at home. Imagine your son or daughter uh, that you appreciate um, for, for passing exams and the one that you don't appreciate what happens. They need this vacuum. So I call it the empowerment model. So in terms of security sector actor, it's, it's, it's a very important conversation because there's been a lot of investment on improving civil and military relationship than forgetting young people. In Africa, investing in civil and military relationship without talking about young people, it's a failure already. Why? 75% of civilians in African population is made up of young people. So how do we reflect on conversations like this without looking at the heart 
of those who make up the community, those who, by the failure of our states and institutions, they are radicalized and join these groups. So our approach has been, how do we make security sector understand that young people are a credible partner, not just for intelligence gathering, but to solve the problems which they are trying to provide solutions to. And to say our approach to solving does not necessitate a gun. It necessitates our ability to connect peer to peer and to go psycho-spiritual to get the results that we're looking at. So it's a complementing approach, which is very important that uh, we have been sharing with security sector actors. I share with you in practical terms. Two years, three years ago, in the far north region of the country where we have Boko Haram, you know, we launched a project called the STAR Project, which aimed at using innovative tools and spots to improve relationship between security sector actors and young people. What happened was communities and security sector actors were inspired that it was young people coming to talk to them about the importance for them to work together, which means that African youth, we as young people, we are taking the other route. Rather than waiting for government to give us some few grants to do work, we are creating a table, bringing the sectors on the table to say we can work on it together. Another practical tip, when we were doing this work, we brought a sports component where we brought vigilante groups, community members, Kanuru youths, who even security sector actors accuses them to be Boko Haram. Then we use sports. Imagine in a sports game where a military official is playing in the same team with a young man who was seen maybe to be trouble. And in one of the games, when this young guy scored, uh, this military captain could not even notice that he was already carrying this young man in euphoria and in, and in joy. This is to say that what we are bringing on the table to resolve this tension that exists, this miscommunication where who is protecting who, you know, is coming up. This has been our strategy. Also, in very practical terms, we also realize that there's this conversation of trying to take people out of violent extremism or to be able to provide solution by ensuring that we train them on livelihoods. It sounds so nice, but who trains who is very important. In our approach, we realized that peer-to-peer -peer approaches are very important and transformative. We went into a community when we were about to set up 420 new businesses, and we realized that the young people were opened to listen to us despite their history of being associated with Boko Haram because it was young people speaking to them. And they asked themselves, if you guys are coming to tell us to be part of the solution where you face the same problem, unemployment, poverty, and everything, and you did not pick up arms. It means there's something we have to learn from you. This is a practical example. The third one is the case of education. Our dear sister talked about, you know, uh, Quranic education and how people perpetually use them. In the Far North region, we noticed that children, young girls, are used for suicide bombs. What happened is that these terrorist groups focus on empowering young women and women something which our communities have failed to do, to use them as an entry point into community. To resolve that, what did we do? We had to inform the security sector to say, you know what, we need to focus on education, education which looks differently. And as a youth organization, we created a school. So in times of conflict where people say back to school, young people created a school. And that school was not created because we had classroom or because we had funding, but because as young people, we saw the need to resolve it collaboratively with security sector actors. And as we speak, since 2018 to today, we have 150 children who are in this program, in conflict hotspots, children who could be used by armed groups, and we have provided an alternative. So alternative is not in big speeches, it's in practice, and it's in processes that young people will be able to identify with. And to close in my remark around this, it's the conversation of DDR. You will bear with me that DDR security sectors feel DDR is DIAS. And governments feel sometimes civil society and young people are making it difficult. The truth is, from my experience, 16 years working across the Chad Basin region, working on the field and designing programs, I can tell you that our experience of transforming violent extremism by providing alternatives could only work because we came as young people 
who are sincere and who are trying to solve a problem, which if we don't solve, we suffer the most at the end of the day. These politicians do not suffer the most in all of this. And we could see a result, we could see it working differently. And to close is the conversation of protection. Who is protecting who? In the case of Nigeria that we've seen in terms of the protests, today, young people are afraid. They see the police or the security sector not to protect them because they fire tear gas on them. My recommendation is, trust me, I always speak with action points. It's very important that we invest a lot on not only training young people, but training security sector actors, governments, politicians to understand how to deal with the unique energy of young people. And finally, to create a safe space where sometimes these security sector actors and other institutions can listen to real life testimonies of how young people are risking their lives to bring change, to solve problems which they did not even cause in the first place. I think if we drive in this path, we'll be moving towards responding to violent extremism very innovatively and once and for all. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Daisy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a very, very interesting and very well-rounded response. And thank you to all the panelists.